This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and join their calls for justice. Okay, Emerald, who would you rather die from COVID? Clive Palmer or the Queen? You have to choose one, right? No one's happy about the situation, but you have to choose one. It's the law. I haven't seen that movie. What's the movie? Sophie's Choice. Sophie's Choice, yeah. Is this kind of what it's about, but the reverse? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's Sophie's Choice, but she wants both kids to die. Children to die. (laughs) My little queen child and my enormous baby, Clive Palmer, and I wish death upon them both, (laughs) which is satire and legally protected. As well. This is this is all satire. We wish nothing but good health to everybody. We believe in universal health care. I do. Even for fucking billionaires who are unvaccinated, probably in a, I don't want to make presumptions about Clive Palmer's health, but I assume he's in <laughs> a higher risk category. Yes. For reasons. Yeah, he is. And he's, <laughs> he's unvaccinated and he had to cancel his National Press Club appearance because he, um, he had COVID-like symptoms. What I'm intrigued by is that they were reported that three ambulances were called <laughs> to his home. I guess that's the thing. Like when you've got theoretically, oh, I don't know, like if, if ambulance services are even free wherever he is. Right. Um, but where they are, if you have a theoretically universal healthcare system, but you're a billionaire and you're used to getting more than everyone else, like you'll find a way <laughs> to double or triple it. You're like, I know I only need one, but I'm a billionaire. Send three. Yeah. Clive Farmer gets ambulance black. You know, he yeah, gets yeah, like- platinum ambulance. <laughs> but can I just say that on 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 the measure of extremities, the most extreme political movement on offer in this election is the Greens. The Greens are far more extreme than Clive Palmer or One Nation. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. A serious danger to Australia. Oh well, good luck, and we wish them well to everybody. No. That's that's what we do. No, we don't? Yeah, I'll just clarify. That's what we do here on Serious Danger. This is the podcast you're listening to, a podcast about green politics in the nation of so-called Australia. I am Tom Ballard. With me is Emerald Moon. Hello, Emerald. Hello, Tom. Hello. This is not an official Greens Party podcast, you guys. Stop asking us whether it is because it's not. We are independent. It's not. From the Australian Greens. <laughs> this week we're chatting about the New South Wales Liberal Government's attack on railway workers and what it tells us about the right to strike in Australia mm. and whether or not billionaires, speaking of billionaires, <laughs> whether billionaires are coming to save us from the climate crisis as Mike Cannon-Brooks makes a bid to try and take over AGL. Our sweet, sexy saviours with crazy eyes. <laughs> Doesn't he just have crazy eyes? He should get a better beard. I feel like he got a billion dollars. He's got like kind of a neck beardy <laughs> kind of patchy thing going on. Yeah, how much does it cost to buy a, a beard, a good beard? Hey, um, follow us on socials, everybody. We're on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Serious Danger AU. Let's bump up those Twitter figs. Let's bump up those Insta numbers. Let's go viral. I think we almost have a 1,000 followers on Instagram, so please follow us on Instagram. That would be really nice. You can find all the info about the show at seriousdangerpod.com. You can become a patron. We've got some new wonderful patrons who are very kindly chipping in a little bit of cash every month to help support the show. How good's that, Emerald? It's really cute and sexy. Kai, Ben, Jasmine, Dave. NVLL. I have no idea how to pronounce it or what name you'd like me to refer to you as, but NVLL. Thank you for being a patron. Fuck yeah. Steve, Estrella, Ruby, and Shannon, welcome to the Serious Danger Patreon family. Thank you so much for your support. You can go to patreon.com forward slash serious danger AU and join their ranks. You know, we've asked people for like three bucks a month, anything like that. That helps us cover the costs of hosting the show, paying our wonderful producer, Michael Griffin. It really helps make this thing real. So thank you so much, dear patrons. Thank you, my loves. Kim is a patron as well. She sent a message saying, hey, Serious Danger crew, I need to thank you for speaking for us who see the corporate corruption and how our government has become CEO servants rather than true public servants. Ooh. As there's a buildup of discontent, the ease of people's instincts of unfairness can be misdirected so completely mm. and it has been on the brink of despair. Please keep up pushing for union drives as working class solidarity is needed before political solutions are within reach. Love the show. Cheers, Kimberly. Kimberly, you bloody angel. Love hearts. That's so sweet. I also, I heard a story, I don't know the name or many details, but I heard through the grapevine that someone started volunteering for the, the Brisbane campaign um, here in Brisbane for the, for the Greens. Had previously been a Labor voter even. What? But 
they're a serious danger listener and they decided to go and volunteer for the greens um which is like yeah truly makes my heart swell if you're still listening maybe you stopped listening maybe you replaced your sunday morning serious danger with door knock i'd be honestly okay with that no totally everyone who's listening now has to live up to that standard do you think there have been people who listened to the show and then been inspired to go and volunteer for the Conservatives or Clive Palmer or One Nation? Yeah, probably more. Like I guess it's like a 90, <laughs> 90 10 kind of ratio. Really, we want to have a neutral impact. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Net zero, <laughs> net zero Palmer volunteers by 2050 is our target. Um. <laughs> please, please support us. Give us money at Patreon. All right, let's jump into this week's topics, uh, what we want to talk about. Obviously, there is um, potentially World War Three occurring <laughs> at the time of recording, um, and we've discussed it extensively. We have nothing to say to improve that situation. We don't want to inflame tensions further, I think, Emerald. Yeah, I know Putin listens. He's a big listener. So we figured, yeah, rather than, you know, furthering, like putting any flames on, on that fire for him, I do want to say please stop. <laughs> Please. But that's all I'll say. Just chill out, pull your head in, everybody involved, and uh, good good luck over there. But also war's bad, so let's not have a war if uh, that can possibly be avoided. But let's yeah. talk about the chapter in the centuries-long war on workers that we saw play out this week. Oh. God, I'm good. The segue. I used to work in fucking radio. I'm sure the, the people, like, terrified about their family in Ukraine are really, <laughs> really pleased with that segue, Tom. <laughs> that's no thing. For months, the Rail, Tram and Bus Union in New South Wales, the RTBU, has been in a dispute with their employer, which is the New South Wales government, currently commandeered by the coalition, over wages and concerns about privatisation. I think their um, enterprise agreement was up in May of 2021 and they've been in Mm -hmm. dispute ever since. Last weekend, the union applied for and was granted approval from the Fair Work Commission, Daddy, (laughs) to engage in low-level protected action over the next two weeks. They weren't going on strike. That's very important to make it clear. The action involved a ban on altered working, which would stop train crews deviating from their designated roles. Basically, they they were Mm -hmm. just going to do their job and not do stuff outside of their job. That was They were going to say, we're not going to do that for this two-week of industrial action. Literal terrorists. Uh, That wasn't going to affect commuters but would inconvenience upper management, uh, as the union (laughs) says. The government tried to get the Fair Work Commission to stop any industrial action whatsoever happening and and they failed in that. In the early hours of Monday morning, Sydney trains made the decision to shut down pretty much the entire rail network due to apparent safety concerns. Mm. 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 Uh, This was being framed as a strike, but, of course, workers had turned up. They turned up at 2 a.m., for fuck's sake, getting ready to work. They were ready to go to work. They were told to go home. It was a lockout, not a strike. Yeah. And maybe it's worth just clarifying what what are the differences between those two, Emerald? What are the differences? Yeah. I mean, one is a decision made by workers and one is a decision made by bosses. Like the bosses decided they couldn't they couldn't come to work. No work for you. Yeah. And why would employers uh, choose that strategy? Why do they want to like lock people out? Surely they want everyone to keep working. That'd be good, yeah? Well, fuck. I mean, this is the question. Like I guess, yeah, what was the strategy behind this? Was it genuinely a misunderstanding of what the implications of the action that the union had decided to take would be? Or was it, with an election coming up, something to do with a union, union-based union scare campaign? Yeah, God. Finally, we landed on that one after all the <laughs> others. We've done the gays, we've done China, mm. and now we're doing unions. Fantastic. Yeah. Have you ever been on strike? Um, That's a good question. No, only the climate strikes. Right. No, have you? Uh, no, no, no either. I mean, yes, I, I love unions and unionism and the, the idea of unions, but I've been a very <laughs> passive member. I was part of the CPSU when I worked at the ABC. I can't remember them doing any uh, national actions while I worked there that involved me anyway. Yeah. And now I'm in the MEAA, but I'm such like a freelancer that, yeah, it's sort of so rare to obviously this is a big part of the fragmented workforce is that I have no workplace to to strike from. If I striked, you know, struck from comedy, a lot of people would say, fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) But I would also, but also this is the point, right, that strikes don't happen very frequently nope. anymore at all. I think most union members, yeah, like I'm in services union, but the likelihood of, yeah, of unions calling a strike these days 
Uh, very low. Yes. Very low. Which, and we'll get to this a little bit more, but yes, that's a combination of yeah. hey, they can't, they're not fucking allowed to. <laughs> not allowed. But, all, but also the very concept of, and the role of the strike in, in workers' rights and the struggle has sort of yeah. changed a lot, uh, particularly over the past 40 years. So the government shuts down the rail network. This obviously left hundreds of thousands of commuters stranded, a lot of chaos, pissed a lot of people off. It was absolutely the government's fault, as we've said. It was their decision, but Transport Minister David Elliott who looks like, have you seen the movie Spawn? No. He looks like a demon is the is the point I'm trying to get to. He tried to blame the unions. He accused the unions of hijacking the city by committing terrorist-like activity <laughs> and the Premier Dominic Perrottet said the unions were intent on causing chaos. Chaos. <laughs> but that all very quickly fell apart as everybody realised that this was bullshit. It was the government's decision. <laughs> On Thursday, the ABC reported that the government had been preparing for a two-week shutdown of the rail network like days before the weekend when this whole thing had gone through. Yeah. And on Tuesday, the New South Wales government had to suck shit and drop its fair work case against the union. The union asked the government to uh, show them the risk assessment that they'd used Mm. to justify the decision to shut down the rail network and uh, the risk assessment wasn't forthcoming, Union State Secretary Alex Klassen said. Fascinating. But moments after they'd asked for it, the government said, ah, don't worry about it, they dropped the claim and... (laughs) No, I've got it. I just don't want to show you. I just don't want to show you right now. Yeah, no, I just want, no, no, just not right now. I just don't. It doesn't matter. Actually, it doesn't matter anyway. For your little union brain. <laughs> um, so it was like it was a pretty wild uh, week, of course. And uh, if people were in Sydney, they would have experienced the the disruption firsthand. But it, it did seem to be like a massive cell phone from the New South Wales government. Is that how you you looked at this story? Was it a big win for workers' rights this week, Emerald? Oh, I don't know if it was a win for workers' rights. I think it was a fucking fucking mess. Like, obviously. Shit show. Yeah, it was a shit show caused by the government. But this is where, yeah, I wish I could go. I would love to door knock in Sydney and find out what people who don't follow the news closely Mm. understood that situation to be because I wouldn't be surprised like a lot of the time the headlines or the message that you get when the thing first happens will be the only thing that people remember. Right. And they may not have received the message that actually the state government was fucking lying Mm. and the shutdown was not due to industrial action or to a strike. Mm. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people still think that it was due to a strike. Right. And are people sympathetic to that, do you think? I, I'm always mm. um, I'm always amazed, not amazed, I'm always encouraged by my impression that most people, certainly most working people in this country, ordinary people, have far more sympathy for and understanding of the importance of workers being able to strike for themselves to get a better deal mm. against the bosses despite 40 years or even longer, seven, like the 70-year war that the Liberal Party has been waging on organised workers and the way that our media demonises union leadership and the very concept of anybody going on strike or withdrawing their labour in order to get a better deal. I think it's quite remarkable how much that persists despite everything. Yeah. Well, it barely even occurred to me, until, like relatively recently, like for example, there, were, there was discussions about potential strikes when workers were being forced back to work at, at the peak of, you know, Omicron, and there was a little bit of discourse about like, oh, you know, should we really be talking about strikes? And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, surely any reasonable person would be like, yep, it's totally okay to withdraw your labor when your boss is putting like your health and life at risk. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I think generally I do wonder, do you reckon it matters what they're striking for and how clear it is? Well, that always gets so so lost. I mean, yeah, Yeah. as far as I can tell, it's based around, I mean, wage claims and inflation is crazy at the moment. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that any wage growth over the past couple of years has been completely outstripped by inflation. So that it means that people's wages take a real cut, right? Wages are actually going backwards and there's been wage stagnation for the past decade. So wages across the board for anybody, you know, Chances are you're getting, you're getting ripped off by capitalism anyway, so fucking go for it, I say. And anyone who claims that any worker is too greedy or or what have you is almost certainly not looked into it enough and is always probably almost always bullshit. Um, and also privatisation concerns, the idea that, you know, liberal liberal government certainly would love to privatise as much as they fucking can. Perite, the Premier, has espoused the virtues of privatisation for years and years and years. And my understanding is that in this dispute, the union is trying to get some guarantees that if privatisation happens, there won't be any job losses. So 
that all seems perfectly reasonable to me. It's so interesting because I could have sworn that I read like a union spokesperson explicitly saying this isn't about pay. Right. It's about, you know, conditions. It's about safety and, yeah, concerns about privatisation. And I often see that it's like, yeah, it's taboo or you don't want to be seen as asking for more pay. Yeah. That that's being greedy to, yeah, like ask that, you know, the, the your income keeps up with fucking cost of living yes or you even get paid a little bit more i mean mm. again the, the the constant the irony of the strike of course is that workers are admonished for going on strike causing massive disruption to the functioning of society and of course that is the entire point of the strike the strike proves <laughs> how valuable their labor is yes and when you take it away it throws everything into fucking chaos so hey maybe if you don't want everything to be thrown into fucking chaos maybe if we recognize collectively how important this labor is People should should get more money Maybe for they should be paid for, it. for doing it. Yeah. And this is how crazy Australia's laws are when it comes to the right to strike. And the, the, the best case of this actually involved the same union back in 2018. People right, m- might remember this, okay? The Fair Work Commission, which was set up by the Labor Party in 2009, by the way, after you know, Rudd gets in, says work choices can fuck off, and work choices was demonic and should have been abandoned, but of course replaced with the Fair Work Act, which has a million restrictions on the right to strike and has fucked over workers in a variety of different ways ever since. That commission has the power to terminate any industrial action that might cause significant economic harm to a boss or the Australian economy. And in 2018, the same union we're talking about in New South Wales, the RTBU, had the application to engage in a 24-hour rail strike preemptively suspended by the commission on the grounds that it would cause so much economic disruption yeah. for Sydney siders. The irony. This commission set up by the government, by the state, can supersede workers' right to strike, to withdraw their labour, which is a fundamental human right that has won extraordinary gains for the working class over the past couple of centuries. This body can say, no, you're not allowed to strike because it would cause too much disruption and would cost too much money and would stop society functioning, which, once again, is the entire motherfucking point. Well, yeah, if we still see the purpose of unions and, like, the Labor Party as the political arm of the unions, if we still see the purpose of that as to gain, like, a better deal for workers, maybe, but arguably it's not. And, you know, we can talk about, like, the Liberals... Obviously, are absolutely fucked on workers' rights and mm. completely aligned with with capital, um, and have a, a long history of privatization. But so do Labor; like they love privatizing shit, and <laughs> they're the ones who implemented the Accord, which just pretty much, yeah, like absolutely gutted unions' power um, in in exchange for you know flexibility and really charted us on this path of neoliberalism in so called Australia. And I would argue now that, yeah, the main purpose of unions is to, like, support Labor Party campaigns. <laughs> it, like, unfortunately, yeah, we don't have unions that do the job that unions should fucking do. Yes. Hashtag not all unions, though. There are some fighting unions out there. RAFWU. RAFWU is sick. RAFWU was great. I would say that there are some elements within, say, the UWU. And, and uh, look, mm-hmm. look, pretty much yeah. most unions in this country are aligned to the Labor Party. Oh, it's kind of part, yeah. of the, part of the fucking deal. But there are plenty of unions that are prepared to reject that and certainly lots of union leaders I know will happily criticise something like the Fair Work Act and say this system fucks over workers. Mm. And you're right. And that that history, you know, predates the accord as well. Like (laughs) as soon as the Labor Party, which came out of defeated strikes in the 1890s, okay, so the Labor movement was just getting its ass kicked to it by pastoralists and stuff, Mm. and they said, okay, well, let's try and get a political party together to win power through the parliament to get a better deal for workers that way. Yeah. And very soon... After they get, started getting electoral success, the Labor Party started seeing its role as to discipline militant workers, yeah. to yeah, discipline strikes, to say, no, everything should go through this arbitration system. Okay, so direct action, which is going on strike and withdrawing your labor, that's naughty, mm-hmm. that's too chaotic, that upsets the economy, which we're now responsible for managing because we control the state. Um, and so the coal strike in the late uh, 40s was was massive. During the Accord period, the Labor government went to war with the pilot strike as well in the late 80s. Yeah. You know, yeah, the Labor government at the state level all the time is not afraid mm-hmm. to demonize striking workers and to try and take them to task. That's yeah. throughout the whole history. Yeah, enshrining the role of, of the state rather than direct worker power, certainly. Yes. And again, capital constantly uh, is never happy with workers having any power whatsoever. In the same week, some other stories that sort of might have missed people's radar, shipping companies were making submissions to this Productivity Commission inquiry into the waterfront, 
pushing for a 64 days notice period before workers can take any strike action. Okay. The current notice period is three days. Why 64? <laughs> Why 64 though? That's what I want to know. I don't, at the moment, if you're a warfie and you want to go on strike, I guess you've got to give your employers three days to let people know that's going to happen. Of course, mm-hmm. it has to happen within the certain period as well and be approved by the Fair Work Commission. And shipping company said, no, you should have to tell us if you want to strike 64 days. <laughs> it's so funny. Briar, please. Yeah. And the Minerals Council of Australia was also making submissions saying, calling for further restrictions on what you can actually bargain for in an enterprise uh, agreement. So, look, no surprise to anybody, but yes, the powers of capital bosses always, always, always will want to run a fear campaign on workers' ability to strike, will want to limit people's power and, um, and really, yeah, narrow and narrow and narrow the scope for change that can be allowed through industrial action. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. I do wonder as well, kind of looping back to that question of how the public would see industrial action these days and and union action and and unions in general, Hmm. whether some of the resistance to or like the lack of sympathy for industrial action and strike is because there's little belief that unions actually can win benefits for workers Mm. and it's like all that the action like the actions are effectively then just seen as useless time suck annoying chaotic back and forth between unions and and bosses that really it never actually delivers substantial wins to ordinary people yeah yeah totally i mean yes i guess when you hobble the union movement or when you actively play a role in its downfall and betray it as labor party has done from the inside I mean, I also think that it might have the inverse effect where strikes are so rare that maybe people are more sympathetic to them. Yeah. I mean, look, I didn't live through the 70s. Everything I read about the 70s is that it was a pretty wild time uh, with lots of strikes. It was an incredible time of workers' power and Labor's share of national income peaked in the 70s, never been as high, been on a steady decline ever since as the union movement has declined. Inflation was substantial and had a massive effect on people's standard of living. But certainly, you know, in the UK as well, it is remembered as a time of economic chaos and industrial militancy and, yeah, great worker power that we can celebrate and is good. But one could understand how in that context maybe ordinary members of the public might get tired of everyone being on strike all the time. I don't know. What about Morrison? Did you like Morrison's attack on the uh, the unions during the lockout? Saying the unions are ramping up, there's no doubt this is a taste of what you can expect from Labor, <laughs> which is so funny. This strike happened under a New South Wales Liberal government and a Liberal federal government. And as we've discussed, again, don't threaten me with a good time, Morrison. I would love it if there were more, <laughs> more strikes under a Labor government, but that's absolutely not going to Yeah, happen. absolutely wouldn't be, unfortunately. And that's the thing. Like, it's so fucking transparent that that's obviously what this is about. Mm. Like, it's an attempt to, yeah, use this for, for an election coming up and both fucking parties are painting it as though it's actually a fight between the ALP and the Liberals when really it's just like transport workers being like, Hello, please, some rights. Yes. Like, and it's, and, and I think what's really interesting as well is that, I mean, I think this is a, a generous, perhaps a generous um, statement from the union, but initially saying that perhaps the action to shut down the network by the state government was made based on a misunderstanding of <laughs> what, of what they were asking for and what impacts um, the action would have. But if that is true, it also says something about how capitalism works and how the fact that workers not having control over, you know, the means of production or having control over the tools of, of their, their work, mm. the impacts that that have where the bosses have no fucking idea how this thing works and yet they're the ones in control. Yes. They make the decision, but they have no fucking idea what they're making a decision about because they don't do the work. They don't actually do the work. Yes. I mean, these claims of safety are so fucking hollow. And, and basically the implication is that, yeah, unions are so reckless and evil that they would endanger the lives of ordinary commuters when yeah. people doing this work are so invested in safety, both their own safety as workers, which much of, you know, occupational health and safety legislation or reforms or changes or wins of the workplace have come through, hey, what do you know, strikes and industrial action. But those workers care so much about it for themselves and for for, for commuters that, yeah, yeah, of course, someone like David fucking Elliot has never worked on yeah. a train, has no idea how... It could possibly uh, work whatsoever. Doesn't give a shit. Um, I do have one question for you. Maybe you have important things to say, but do you know the name of the New South Wales Public Services Association Secretary? I don't know. Stuart Little. 
I was reading an article and they kept quoting Stuart Little. And I was like, what, the mouse? I wonder if he's ever heard any jokes about that. No, probably not. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, my last question for you is where are the greens on this stuff and how, and, you know, it's been a recurring theme. We've talked about it once or twice on the show, but the greens does not have the kind of connection to the formalized union movement mm. in Australia that the ALP does. And we don't get much money whatsoever from various unions. Unlike the ALP, the ETU used to donate a fair bit of money to our advance campaign. They've ended that relationship. ETU have gone back to supporting the ALP now. Um, the NTEU, that's the National Tertiary Education Union. So a lot of people who work in universities and such. And we have a relationship with RAFWU, the radical fighting union in the retail sector, which is taking on the shitty SDA. I don't know. What, what do you make of the Greens' approach to, to workers' rights or did you see them making much noise about this particular strike this week generally? Oh, I didn't see any coverage of of the Greens as part of this story because, yeah, I don't think in, in the public imagination and, you know, in Australian politics, for some reason the Greens don't figure in the, like, Labor versus Capital relation, even though we're the only ones who actually support Labor's rights and the right to strike and, you know, worker control and we oppose privatisation where Labor and the Liberals consistently privatise public assets. Um, They consistently, you know, cut or suppress workers' wages and we support, you know, higher wages um, and a greater share of money going towards Labor rather than than capital. But, yes, I like still historically and, and ongoing, again, I think because unions are effectively now serving as little more than, you know, established unions serving as little more than a funding and and support arm for the Labor Party in this desperate hope that maybe one day we'll get back and we'll change the rules and then, you know, we'll we'll get the real real unions rights again. But I don't I don't think it's going to happen and and I don't know if it'll ever change and the unions <laughs> will come on board, but I know the Greens try to work with the unions and and we're the ones who have policies consistent with their ideals. Mm. But yeah. Do you still tell people to join the union and and still get on board and I, it seems like a conflict that the more I, I learn more about yeah, leftist positions and the history of the union movement and the current state of the union movement and things that the unions do, mm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I still oh, think I wouldn't, being I, a union member is important. Yeah, I, no, like I definitely wouldn't be like, no, don't join your union. Like most yeah. Greens members that I know are union members. In fact, uh-huh. I think that's actually like I think, yeah, union density among Greens membership is like very high. Okay. At the same time, yeah, I wouldn't be promising that that's like your avenue for change unless especially even if you try and be really active and do some change from within, don't get your hopes up. But, yeah, like I think particularly some of those those other unions that are coming up like RAFU, they do fucking awesome work. Yeah. Uh, the greatest quote from the pandemic to me uh, on this came from our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who I don't know if you remember this, but during a National Press Club um, announcement, he said the pandemic had changed everything, including, I guess, r- relations between capital and labour. He said, there are no more unions, there are no more bosses, wow. we're all just Australians now. <laughs> <laughs> we are one, but we are many. Enough of that. Let's shit on uh, billionaires, please. What's going on? Uh, shit on billionaires. But why would we do that, Tom, when they're coming to save us? When they're not dying from COVID. They're when coming they're not to dying save us from, from COVID. COVID. Yeah, yeah. There's good billionaires and there's bad billionaires. Oh. And we're here to talk about sweet angel billionaires now. Okay, good. So the story that I'm talking about, of course, is Mr. Cannon Brooks. Um, this happened. So last Saturday, we, we learned about it on Sunday that uh, last weekend, tech billionaire Mike Cannon Brooks and the Canadian asset management firm Brookfield, very confusing, Brooks and Brookfield, I'm already lost. Yes. <laughs> they announced a joint $8 billion bid to take over AGLs, power generation and energy retail divisions. And the idea would be that they would take it over and then they'd bring forward the planned coal closures. So they'd close those coal-fired power stations earlier and put an extra $20 billion into building renewables to replace that capacity. Sounds good to me. Yep. Uh, my first question, Tom, for you. <laughs> so so Mike Cannon Brooks' company, it, it was all about like Mike as the star of this. Um, and even though apparently like his bid forms a much smaller part of this than Brookfield, this this Canadian-owned company. But Cannon Brooks is doing it through his company, Grok Ventures. <laughs> do you know what Grok means? Uh, I don't know what Gronk. Does that have anything to do with you, Gronk? I'm sure you know what Gronk means. I'm aware of Gronks. This is so, okay, just as an aside, if anyone knows what Grok means and uses this in their daily parlance, please, like, let me know because... <laughs> 
I only discovered in the last year or so that people don't know what grok means. And it's such a, it's like so much part of my vocabulary. My mom oh, all right. would something always you're use very it. familiar grok, with. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So grok means that you like get something, you understand it kind of intuitively. You really grok it. <laughs> like I really grok that. And I think it's, I only, after realizing that it wasn't like a normal English word that people use. Absolutely used, not. No. I, yeah. And people kept going, do you mean gronk? Um, and I'm like, no, not fucking gronk. I mean, grok, G-R-O-K. Um, I think it comes, it comes from like a science fiction book or movie, like right. where the inhabitants of Mars or something like that, it's part of their language. And so I think like Boomin or maybe like Gen X nerds are really into it, which, which is why I thought it was funny that his company is called what grok ventures, because I'm sure that it's a reference to that. But anyway, I grok your company comes from a 1961 science fiction novel stranger in a strange land there you go by robert a heinlein the oxford english dictionary summarizes the meaning of grok as to understand intuitively or by empathy to establish rapport with mm. i gotta say i don't grok it wow i don't grok it at all wow well i'll <laughs> i grok you i grok you tom even if you don't grok me <laughs> um, but anyway, so Grok, we got Grok, we got Mike, we got Brooks, we got Brookfield. Um, <laughs> they want to, they want to buy a- AGL. And a lot of people might be asking, why? Why would Mike Cannon Brooks want to do this? So for people who don't know Mike Cannon Brooks, he's a tech billionaire who is very well known for his climate activism i guess you could say activism yeah his company's atlassian i refuse to learn what they fucking do i don't know what that is yeah. i don't know what that really is it's a software thing question mark sure but it's made him shit loads of money he's very rich very rich and yep yeah, in in the age of rich people being climate warriors he's a perfect protagonist and one of the big things that this bid would do so he's like okay i'm gonna buy agl and force them to close their power plants earlier than they otherwise would have. And a big way they do that is by stopping this proposed demerger of AGL's retail and generation divisions. Right. So AGL have decided they want to carve off retail, which would stay as AGL, and then keep their their generation, as in their, their power plants, under this new company, Accel Energy. And that's problematic because it it solidifies theoretically a long future for those power plants, including coal-fired power stations. The like the AGL's website speaks about this demerger. It's I fucking love reading like business, like corporation websites. The language they use is so funny to me. But anyway, the proposed demerger of AGL Energy will create a strong future for both parts of our business, which is kind of problematic when we don't want a strong future for coal. <laughs> like that's bad. No, no future. Yes. Sorry. I mean, everyone likes strong futures. Strong future sounds good. Yeah. But if you're in the coal industry, no, that's yeah. bad. We want a weak, non-existent future for you, please. Yeah, and the last part of that sentence is about like and enable facilitating Australia's transition to, you know, climate renewable, net zero, 2050, whatever. All of which we know net zero by 2050 will be fucked. Um, like IPCC report, all of the science says that we need to phase out coal and gas, 75% cut on emissions by 2030 to reach net zero by 2035. I believe. Yes. So, yeah. So uh, the, the plans by AGL to split off this new company, Excel, which would then keep burning coal until 2045, is absolutely fucked. And, yeah, and so this this proposal would bring that forward to to close all of their coal-fired power stations by 2030 and replace about the 7 gigawatts of generation with 8 gigawatts of renewables. What's interesting is, yeah, like, I mean, already the, the proposals, the proposal by AGL also doesn't say anything about gas in when they're talking about their, their climate credentials. And in fact, when I had another dig around their website, they were talking about a new gas-fired power station that they're proposing in Tamago near, near Newcastle, which they say is, quote, consistent with our move to a renewable energy mix. <laughs> um, that old, like, the fact that people are still even using this when we know that, you know, gas um, is extremely bad for, for the environment. Methane is, is a very significant um, fossil fuel and, and fugitive emissions. I think gas make up like a fifth of our emissions as a country. Yeah. And, and that's growing. It Obviously, as, as coal is tracking down, gas is, ta- is, gas is making growing. up more and more of that mix. Yeah. Yeah. So gas is not a transition fuel. And the argument that it's necessary for, quote unquote, firming, firming the grid or, you know, for, for bringing up capacity basically to fill in when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing is kind of bullshit because instead we should be investing in, you know, renewable storage to to fill in those gaps. And this is what 
Mike Cannon Brooks and, and Brookfield are, are talking about. And that's that's great. Like I believe I kind of don't want to spend time talking about the logistics of whether it's possible to do what they say they want to do because it, it fucking is. And anyone who's saying that, that that it's not, it's just bullshit and and it's politics. That's not true. And I must say, you know, and I'm sure we'll get to the problems with the billionaires doing stuff, but when Mike Cannon yeah. Brooks goes on the project and Steve Fry seems to think, <laughs> uh, uh, won't you uh, affect uh, rail prices, uh, retail prices? And Cannon Brooks looks into the barrel and says, yes, it's going to make it cheaper, you fucking moron. Mike, let's talk about what this does to retail prices. Um, before you bought your Harbourside mansion, I was lucky enough to be a guest there. It's a pretty big footprint. Uh, average Australians within their rights to see you as being a hypocrite given how much electricity you consume in that big house? Uh, Man, I think you'd be surprised that my electricity consumption is actually negative. <laughs> yes, but you're still using baseload power. You're just offsetting it because you can. I'm exporting more power than I'm importing. That's the way the power grid works. Okay. So you, you don't think this is going to have an impact on retail prices if you take over AGL? I do think it's going to have an impact on retail prices. I think we're going to bring retail prices down. Beautifully exposes how tired and pathetic and lazy this kind of knee-jerk reaction from conservatives to any suggestion that renewables might you know, replace our energy grid, which is something we can totally do and will make things better and cheaper for everybody. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, you see stuff like that and I get, I get why some people might be enthused or invested in the idea of Michael Cannon Brooks, Elon Musk, et cetera, coming to save us. Yeah, absolutely. And it is true. Like the fucking limp response from the media, I think particularly the media that are still stuck in this, you know, more conservative media, I, I suppose, that the only line that they can do, having no class analysis was, yeah, is this going to make, you know, is this going to make energy more expensive? How's it going to affect cost of living? Obviously bullshit. And then the the like, but you participate in society line. Aren't you a hypocrite? Because you have a house, a big house. Yes. And don't you use energy <laughs> as though one house, first of all, is going to be making a larger contribution to, to climate change than, you know, massive industry. Yes. And then as Mike Cannon Brooks points out, he's like, well, it's actually negative because I have renewables and I feed more into the grid than I, than I use. Yes. Um, so that's just, I mean, it's so weak. And he's the exception. It should be very clear. He's the exception within the fucking super rich 1%. There are, there are, yes. I'm sure there are very conscious billionaires out there, but um, overwhelmingly the top 1% has a massive outsized carbon footprint than, than the rest of us. So yes, Steve Price, if you want to make the point that we live in a class society and there is a, a ruling class oligarchy globally that's destroying <laughs> the planet and we should do something about it. Welcome, that. comrade. Welcome, comrade, Steve Price. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's like, there's that take, but then probably the take that you and I and people listening to this podcast came across more was among the liberal media, the, you know, center left media and, and commentators fawning all over Mike Cannon Brooks and, and Brookfield for quote unquote, putting his money where his mouth is. <laughs> this headline that was like the hippie billionaire who is putting his money where his mouth is on climate change, oh, no. which is just so fucking cringe. And <laughs> as though, yeah, like as though this billionaire is is coming to to save us because he really cares. And isn't it fantastic that he's stepping in where governments won't, even though he's literally said in statements to media, this is not a philanthropic exercise. <laughs> Like I'm doing this as an investor, which is, yes. this is the interesting question, you know, financially, what is the value? Like he's calculating effectively that the value of AGL's retail arm, as in the infrastructure that AGL has, you know, with a, um, a well-trained workforce, like established procedures, it's got 4.5 million customers or so, mm. that that's incredibly valuable even without productive coal power. Right. Which I think is true, but AGL are saying that it's worth even more. They rejected the bid because they're like, no, you need to give us more money. <laughs> <laughs> more money, please. More money, yeah. Yes, he's saying explicitly, and and, and this is obviously the uh, regularly the um uh, the line that we're sold, right? That we can have a a, a clean transition and we can make shitloads of money. It could actually mm -hmm. like you know make it in, in, we can everybody can win. Yeah. Out of the uh, transition to a renewable energy, no one has to lose any money, and everyone will have a wonderful time. Yeah. Switch your investments to clean, clean energy. <laughs> energy you know, yes. rearrange your share portfolio. Yeah, the market system <laughs> that got us to this point can continue on. It's just like it'll just be green. It's green capitalism now. Yeah, I mean, I can believe that Michael Cannon Brooks would do something that would lose him shitloads of money for the sake of uh, environmental action. 
because he has shitloads of money, right? And I and I, mm. I that's sort of a sweet bonus of being a billionaire, right? You can probably lose hundreds of millions of dollars on various projects that you have, uh, like Clive Palmer. You can build a dinosaur island or whatever the fuck. It's fine because you just have shitloads of resources. Now, obviously, you know, billions and billions of dollars investments, he's, he has to make a business case yeah. to get other people on board and will hope to wreak, uh, you know, a return on that investment further down the track. But ultimately, the point is the fact that an individual shouldn't have that much money and power in the first place to wield at his whim. Yeah, absolutely. Because the, the reverse of <laughs> Michael Gatter Brooks, of course, is what? Gina Reinhardt is Clive Palmer, is Twiggy Forrest, is yeah. all the bad billionaires, so to speak. Well, yeah. And it is so funny. I mean, so it was rejected, like th- this bid from Mike Cannon Brooks and from Brookfield was rejected by, by AGL. They kind of indicated that they would be open to considering a higher bid. They were saying that this takeover bid for, you know, just under 5% of the closing share price on on the Friday before that bid was made was too low. And for a takeover, they want something like 30, 40% higher than share price. Brooks and Brookfield say that this is a relatively fair offer when you consider the three much average of, of shares and also that the price is likely to drop following that, that demerger and the split mm. into AGL and Excel. But it's also, again, returning to the fact that this isn't just Cannon Brooks. We're looking at, at Brookfield, this this Canadian um, company. And so if it were to go ahead, even if AGL accepts this bid, it then has to jump through all the bloody big government red tape uh, <laughs> interference in the free market. Mm-hmm. Um, it has to face, you know, Foreign Investment Review Board, probably a C review, and could potentially just be vetoed by the treasurer. There's a really interesting article explaining how this might work. I don't think we have time to kind of go into it, but Michael West did a really good article on this and where the government sits and how interesting it is that I didn't realize this. So Brookfield, this company has apparently already just, it's been buying up energy assets and significant like assets, assets in Australia. And Josh Frydenberg has, as treasurer, has been waving that through. And so if he were to try and stop this, it would be a significant like reversal of the direction that he has been taking. Mm. But it also would be significant because then this one company owns a massive proportion of, of the energy market, of, of the energy grid. So Jesus Christ. And but the other thing Who who used to own that energy grid? Sorry, just by the just remind me, like who um, was it sort of who who used to like sort of pay for all this to set up? The market, right? The so, public, like the people of Australia the, oh, the, sort of paid for and sort of helped set up mm, the copyright. functioning of Australia, like the energy grid, which is a fundamental part of like having a society. Okay, right. And yeah. then we sold all that to a bunch of companies and re- didn't really give a shit whether those companies were based in France or, or Australia yeah. or anything like that. And yeah. now it's all sort of falling apart. That's weird. Well, but surely those companies will be, you know, paying tax and then feeding back in. So we don't have to pay for it, but they pay a tax. Uh, <laughs> apparently not. Apparently Brookfield <laughs> is like notorious tax dodgers. Um, as Michael West said in his article, Brookfield doesn't fucking pay tax. And so that's one thing to consider, like billionaires, bad, massive companies, bad. They are not, they're doing it for themselves. They're not doing it because they care about us and our, and our climate. They wouldn't do it if it weren't for profit, because this is the problem. When you run something for profit, you run it for profit. You don't run it (laughs) for the good of the people. Um, Cannon Brooks has had some dodgy, like some tax accusations about himself as well. Has he? I guess, like any super rich person, of course, people, yes. And then, you know, he's asked about it. He goes, oh, you know, it's all through, it's all declared it on the books. And mm. well, I think Atlassian, you know, gets a lot of that research and development um, exemption so that, yeah, doesn't yeah. have to pay Atlassian, rather, I should say, rather than himself, Michael Cannon Brooks. Right. As, as far as I know, but it's Atlassian facing some serious tax dodging accusations. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, yeah. But we live in this insane. Like we're in this insane place where the market actually is like better on climate than the government. Yeah. Um. You know, AGL and Origin. In even in the last few weeks, there's been all this news about bringing forward coal closures. The like the Australian energy market operator, the Integrated Systems Plan, is released at the end of last year. This is for for 2022 and. Some fairly significant predictions in there saying that coal closures will happen three times faster than expected. 
based on, you know, the way that the market is going and the fact that renewables are just more competitive than, than fossil fuels. And yet we hear very little from the major, you know, governments aren't going, oh, okay, clearly like this is what's happening. We no longer need to prop up fossil fuels. We should be investing in what's good for the economy since that's what we care about, right? But no, they continue, you know, desperately like propping up the fossil fuels, coal and gas, approving new coal and gas projects, handing public money to them to 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 keep going. Mm. It gets to the point where it's like, what is the rationale behind that approach from both major parties, if not ideological? Like, if not just tied to this kind of mythological idea of the role that fossil fuels play in Australia, mm. completely separate from the actual economic role that they play. Totally. I'm not the first one to say it whatsoever, but it's come up a fair bit on my other podcast talking to people. The debate around coal particularly has become a culture war. Yeah. Coal culture war? Oh, no. No? no. Can we cut that out, please? <laughs> In the coalition, I once did a coalition. Yeah, joke, coalition. So who the fuck am I to talk? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like it's it, it removed from any kind of, as you say, raw economics. You know, political cynicism. Um, these culture war lines have been drawn, and I, I suppose it also helps that in some very marginal electorates, which which often mm. elect federal elections come down to, you have coal mining communities. Plenty of politicians are happy to to ride that funded by donations from these these very industries and a very close and cosy relationship between the political class and kind of ruling class folks in Minerals Council of Australia, for example. Uh, people are very happy to fight out this in the face of all evidence whatsoever. Someone like Matt Canavan doesn't give a fuck mm. about anything, wants more you know, new coal-fired power stations, even if they don't stack up economically. I think that, think that this is when the government yeah. should step in to intervene in the economy. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is when the only time is when they can uh, set up a new fucking... <laughs> coal-fired power station, you know, it's insane. Yeah, which is the irony because, you know, we talk about the absolute fucking disaster of privatisation and the fact that we sold off our our energy assets. But even in Queensland where our energy generators, we, you know, I think maybe majority or at least a lot of our energy generation is still publicly owned, which is great. And it could be an opportunity for the state government to actually control a planned transition away from coal and gas mm. and to replace that with publicly owned renewable energy from which, you know, the public can can benefit rather than private enterprise and, and you know, for private profit. And yet here in Queensland, we had a fucking coal-fired power station, a turbine explode last year and like black out you know, half of Queensland for hours, <laughs> so much for like the fucking magic of fossil fuels keeping the lights on. Mm. But anyway, that happens. And this old, unstable, unreliable power station, instead of saying, okay, maybe it's time to retire this and replace it with publicly owned renewable energy, the state government goes, we will fix it. We will rebuild. Like, we will continue fucking propping up coal and we will continue burning coal for many decades to come, which the Labor state government continually says they will keep burning coal for fucking decades to come. That is their plan. Mm. And that repair, it's it's jointly owned with a, with a private company, 50-50. But the cost is estimated at $200 million. So the state government theoretically is putting that $100 million into rebuilding coal instead of replacing it with renewable energy. And so, yeah, like even when we've got publicly owned generation, apparently it's still not enough if your government A, is owned by fucking fossil fuel companies via donations and B, has this like just absolute cowardly, like they are terrified of doing anything to upset the mythology around the role of coal in the Australian economy and particularly in Queensland. Well, maybe they wouldn't have to do that if Bob Brown hadn't got on a fucking convoy. Exactly. Exactly. It's our fault. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot. Please tell me that the Greens have some good policies on this, Errol, that would make this better. Well, yes, that's the thing. So not only do the Greens support public ownership of energy generation, but also of retail, because that's another thing in Queensland. We own the generators, but we don't own the the, the retail, and that's still run like a private company. It's still run for profit mm. because what it comes back to is, yeah, that fundamental principle that if there is an essential service yeah. that people need to live their lives, 
it should be publicly owned. So that's kind of just the fundamental principle. Yeah. Um, and also another great example of the market logic of competition yeah. being bullshit. It's yeah, not yeah. like there are different kinds of electricity that you need to try and that you want to compete against each other. You just want it on at all times when you need it yeah. at the lowest possible price. And it's it's hard, I reckon, for people our age and younger to imagine a world in which that was the case. But before the 90s, or late 80s certainly, Almost every single state in the in the country was responsible for that stuff. They were set up by government organizations that ran the entire energy process and you bought your energy from the government at very low prices. Yeah. Now, a lot of conservative governments ran down the government organizations that was managing those kind of energies, like just cutting and cutting and cutting to the point of making them unsafe and running them down, which makes them shit, which then justifies the case for them to sell them off and hand mm-hmm. them over to the wonderful private sector, which will make them super efficient. Yeah, but even even when we have a situation in Queensland where we have publicly owned energy, the, the energy regulator then has to step in and like impose particular like rules on those public generators so that they don't outcompete the private market <laughs> because that is how important it is in fucking so-called Australia that like private companies are allowed to make a profit. So these <laughs> these fucking retails and, and, and energy companies are still allowed to price gouge mm. and operate completely inefficiently in a way that does not deliver stable, cheap energy to consumers so that capital can continue making money. It's really cool. But this, that's why, yeah, so, so I think it was last week the Greens announced their policy that they would kind of repurpose Snowy Hydro as a not-for-profit, publicly-owned renewable energy generator and retailer. And that would enable them to, first of all, ensure that as a basic principle, energy is for people and not for profit. Yeah. And it would also enable them to phase out coal and gas by 2030 and replace it with 25 gigawatts of renewables. So, you know, you'd, you'd push power prices down, you'd end price gouging, and you facilitate the kind of transition away from, from fossil fuels and the, and the emissions reductions that are actually required to keep global warming at or, or under 1.5, maybe even we'd probably even still be pushing it to, to two degrees, but levels that we might fucking survive at. <laughs> um, really, really, you know, really utopian stuff here. Um, <laughs> That's what climate policy is about, Emerald. Climate policy yeah. is about winning an election, you idiot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so stupid. Um, and I was, I mean, as usual, the fucking, the fairy, fairyland greens, the parliamentary budget office that, you know, costed this policy. They said it would cost $40 billion. And so that's the line that, that obviously the media was running with it. It's a massive $40 billion investment. And the question becomes, yeah, why not let the billionaires pay? Because it's the fucking job of the government to deliver essential services. And because as we are seeing, if you leave it up to the market, they will fuck you over. Absolutely. And they will also engender this like insane instability for consumers who, you know, we see shit like this, like this AGL bid happening, like the early coal-fired power station closures, um, you know, Hazelwood closing suddenly in, in Victoria in 2017, um, the fact that Error Ring, the biggest coal-fired power station in the country in New South Wales, that coal closure has been brought forward by, by seven years. This is going to be happening more and more and these facilities will be closing without a plan. Mm. And so the coal workers that the major parties claim to be, you know, looking after and that apparently the Greens have such disdain for when we talk about an orderly phase out of fossil fuels, they are the ones who will be completely fucked over and already are being fucked over when they're told they, you know, they thought they had this long in their job. Actually, no, we're, we're closing in a couple of years or we're closing suddenly. So fucking sort it out. Well, also just this week, we had a policy announcement from the Greens on the very subject, another $19 billion plan. Boom, we're getting this money from <laughs> sweet billionaires and um, and maybe not spending every spare dollar on a fucking missile to launch in China, maybe. But um, a new policy, a $19 billion plan to subsidise the wages of fossil fuel workers who transition into new jobs. The proposal would subsidise half the wage of the workers' new job in non-polluting industries outside the coal, oil and gas sectors. Adam Band said, we owe coal workers a debt of thanks for powering our country. We don't need to choose between taking urgent climate action and supporting coal communities. We can do both. We're also talking about money to diversify coal communities via grants. So, you know, investing in these communities as we move them away from coal, which is something that we have to do to address the climate crisis, and guaranteeing their standard of living and helping them retrain and reinvest and, you know, just keep living in the communities that they live in and love as they have a right to do. It's the only way to do it. Again, leaving the idea that the the market will keep it going, even if they sustain the life of these either coal mining or, or coal-fired power plants for, for a little bit longer, 
once it's done, once it's no longer profitable, they'll say, see you, mates. Good luck to you. We don't have any responsibility to look after you and they'll fuck off. So, of course, the state and, you know, not-for-profit organizations or, or, or a not-for-profit ethos has to guide that transition because, yeah, capital won't, doesn't give a fuck. They don't care at all. Michael Cannon Brooks won't be out there helping you, helping you go back to uni. <laughs> enemy of my enemy is my friend. Welcome, Clive. Well, firstly, let me say I'm not vaccinated, that I don't intend to be vaccinated. Be really pleased to hear, like, a couple of folks have been messaging saying that the show is helping them move back from kind of inaction and despair about the state of the world into actually doing things, Aww. which is why we like to do, we like to do our little call to action. This weekend, the the March for Justice is happening again that, you know, kicked off. The, there was some marches, marches last year. And I think on, on Sunday, all across the country, there are a few different March for Justice events in major cities. And you can even, you know, register your own event if you can't make it to one. So you can head to marchforjustice.org.au. You can also donate there if you, if you can't get to an event or you're listening to this episode before the march is already finished. Um, just go and see if you can help out. You know, they're, they're calling for an end to the state-sanctioned violence against First Nations women as well as an end to, you know, domestic abuse and, and violence perpetrated against women everywhere. And the other thing that we, you know, we, we really wanted to, to have, uh, we're going to have Kristen O'Connell on the show today talking about the anti-poverty centre's um, work, but she was very busy doing that actual fucking work um, <laughs> so I couldn't come on. But you should absolutely support their Abolish the Work for the Doll campaign. Um, we'll put the link in, in the show notes and there's a survey that folks can take as well. Yes, you don't just have to give in money, obviously, because potentially if you've experienced Australia's horrific um, welfare system and the mutual obligation system, maybe you don't have shitloads of cash kicking around. That's totally fair enough. If you've experienced the Work for the Dole program, the Anti-Poverty Centre want to hear from you about your experience to inform their survey and the kind of submissions they can put out there and to inform this campaign. If you have a bit of cash uh, that you can spare and chuck into them, that would be fantastic. The Anti-Poverty Centre do fantastic work and, yeah, they want to, campaign hard on this to get rid of mutual obligations which are dehumanizing and unnecessary and cruel and the work for the doll program which is basically exploitative labor that we don't want there's also a great uh, blog post on the anti-poverty website this week from jay coonan who's a member of that group talking about the story that people might have seen in which the services australia was basically introducing the idea of hiring private investigators to spy on people on welfare cursed make sure they're not well for cheats quote unquote or frauds it's it's a horrific and shocking. Be something they've done before, as I make yeah. uh, clear in this in this uh, blog post, um, and it's that kind of shit that absolutely needs to be resisted. So, antipovertycenter.org. But yeah, check out the show notes for more details. Serious Danger is produced by Michael Griffin and made possible with the help of the Green Institute. You can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. Don't forget to follow us on socials. We're at Serious Danger AU on Twitter and Instagram. And you can email us at hello at seriousdangerpod.com. Y hasta el próximo episodio. Te veo a la, la semana próxima. Yeah, what she said, I assume. Besos. We'll see you next week. And happy Mardi Gras too. Mardi Gras, it's Mardi Gras next weekend. Mm, so yeah. fucking have a good time. Be queer and enjoy it. Do it. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. And, and uh, nothing but a speedy recovery to Clive Palmer, of course. Oh, see Clara. Okay. <laughs> 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 this is a serious danger to Australia.